Good morning. Welcome to breakout session two. This is track one climatology. My name is Drew Thornley. I'm an energy policy analyst in Austin, Texas. I contribute to, uh, all right, we have, a, we have a Longhorn fan. I write for uh, Heartland's monthly environment climate news uh, letter. And I'm happy to be moderating this morning. We have with us this morning on our panel, Professor Don Easterbrook and State Senator from Minnesota, Mike Jungbauer. Professor Easterbrook will be going first. Uh, he's got quite a long, extensive bio. I'll just hit some highlights, uh, but you can, you can see his bio in our, in our program. He's an emeritus professor of geology at Western Washington University, where he has conducted research on global climate change in North America, New Zealand, Argentina, and other parts of the world for almost 50 years. He's written three textbooks and other books, about 150 papers in professional journals, and has presented 30 research papers at international meetings in 12 different countries. Please join me in welcoming Professor Easterbrook. Thanks. There are, there are two things in life that you don't want to hear. Uh, one is when you're at the dentist and he says, oh no. <laughs> and the other one is when you're a speaker and the technician says, oh, we don't have your slides. <laughs> the latter is the case here. That's why we're a little bit late. And when I heard that, I thought, well, hell, I'd just soon be next door and watching this all star cast. Anyway, why don't we all just go next door and we'll sit around and have a cup of coffee later and talk about all this other stuff. <laughs> but at any rate, thanks for coming. And um, th there are some uh, interesting things now uh, going on with respect to new data um, that I think um, sheds a lot of light on, on, on global climate change. Um, global warming is over. By global warming, I'm only talking about that part uh, of the um, warming and cooling, which is so typical of the Earth, that has happened since uh, 1977, and which seems to have ended in 1998. So when I talk about global warming in the sense that it's used uh, in the uh, context of the, the debate going on right now, that's what I'm talking about. The Earth is always warming and cooling, so Global warming is not over forever, just this phase is over. And the reason for saying that is based on geologic, oceanographic, uh, and, and solar uh, evidence. So I'm going to start with uh, the glacial evidence, because glacials, uh, glaciers are uh, a really good way of recording ancient climate changes. They are responsive to changes in climate because they depend on snow in the winter for nourishment, and they are melted in the summer by, uh, by summer heat. And so they advance and retreat um, according to what the climate is doing. And then they leave a record of that that we can read. And so we can go back uh, in terms of uh, decades or centuries or thousands of years or tens of thousands of years. And the glacier fluctuations we know match global climate change. So they make a really good proxy for determining what's gone on in the past. And that's what I've been doing for my entire career. And then uh, we know that temperature changes in the atmosphere, glacier fluctuations uh, in, on land, uh, are also related to ocean temperature changes in, in a very um, cause and effect way. Oops, this doesn't want to advance. There we go. Um, let me first um, talk a little bit about what you can tell from a glacier. And then we'll look at specifically at, whoops, how do I go back here now? Uh, this one, maybe here, maybe Previous start. Step. Give myself here. Glacier fluctuations uh, during the, the last 500 years record a, a very nice sequence of uh, oscillations in the Earth's climate. And in particular, um, if we want to talk about the Little Ice Age and the, the so-called hockey stick, that uh, is uh, much in the news and serves the basis for much of the um, AGW um, contention that climate has always been the same. Uh, here is an, uh, as an example, and there are many examples, and I'm just going to show you one here. Uh, the present um, margin of, of the glaciers, if I can get an arrow here again, is right here. But if you look about a kilometer down the valley here, this is where the glaciers were during the Little Ice Age. Uh, which according to man doesn't exist or didn't exist. And um, it's about a kilometer. The, the next glacier over, uh, this one, 
the little ice age advance was about two kilometers down the valley well here is where those margins plot on a map the present margin is here and here is where the glacier was during the little ice age two kilometers farther down the valley so this tells us then that the little ice age did in fact exist and although I'm showing you one specific example this same pattern is repeated globally we see this almost everywhere where there are alpine glaciers in the world in both hemispheres the northern hemisphere and the the southern hemisphere what makes it even more interesting is if you look at the glacial deposits that are here that represent the little ice age what are they resting on these deposits are resting on a forest which was living here during the medieval warm period and the medieval uh, warm period forest is growing on older glacier deposits which means that uh, following the uh, an advance of, of glaciers the medieval warm period caused those glaciers to retreat far enough so that a forest grew <coughs> where the ice had been formerly and it was overridden by the little ice age glaciers so we have evidence here of both the medieval warm period and also the little ice age contrary to uh, the so-called man uh, hockey stick there's also a very nice record of um, advances of the glacier uh, in subsequent time that is subsequent to the little ice age uh, on this diagram you see the early 1600s that's the little ice age extent uh, of the Deming glacier which uh, shown in the upper right hand corner in blue and then as you go up valley from that there is a, a, a morainal ridge left by uh, a glacier that was stable there for a period of time about 1830 which formed during another phase of the little ice age during what's called the Dalton minimum the 1600s formed during the Maunder minimum and then farther up valley the glaciers then retreated and then were then readvanced and were stable from about 1880 until about uh, eight, uh, 1910 uh, or so something like that another cold period uh, and then the glacier retreated after that during the warm period that culminated in the um, warmth of the 1920s 1930s uh, there was a readvance of the ice in the um, period cool period from uh, about 1945 to 1977 and then the great climate shift in 1977 the glaciers <coughs> began to retreat again so what I'm saying about is that the glaciers record very nicely the total picture of climatic changes uh, in this particular part of, of the world uh, here's one example this is the, the Boulder Glacier um, on Mount Baker in, in the state of Washington it has a very nice record and uh, that record of advance and retreats uh, in historic time um, shows that in 1940 the ice margin was here retreated here in 47 here in 56 and then we move over here after 19 oops sorry after um, 1956 the ice began to advance advance to here um, in the 60s advanced to here and got all the way down here by 1979 um, so here's the 1979 margin showing that the glacier readvanced all the way from clear up the top where it says boulder all the way to the end and the, the importance of this is that you get the impression from what you read in various places that the ice was retreating constantly from the little ice age all the way through to the present and that's simply not the case. The glaciers are going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with every climate change. And they've done this four times uh, in this past century alone. So we know that uh, the glaciers are not just um, retreating because of so-called um, global warming. Since 1977, which was a time when uh, the climate shifted from cool uh, to warm, the glacier has retreated up until 1998. And in this particular case, the Boulder Glacier had retreated uh, about 1,560 feet during that warm period. So there's no doubt there was a warm period from 1977 to 1998. Nobody doubts that. So you hear the phrase, global warming deniers, that doesn't mean anything. Everybody believes in global warming. The question is, is it caused by CO2? So it's a wrong question. There's no such thing as a global warming denier, unless you're crazy, or, or unless you haven't been reading anything. So what's the connection then? between glaciers and temperature and the oceans. So we're gonna bring the oceans in now. And the um, temperature fluctuations that you see uh, on, on the middle diagram here 
This is the warming that took place from about 1915 to about 19, uh, well, darn it, I can just barely touch this thing and it goes crazy. Okay. <coughs> I guess I'm glad I'm not a brain surgeon. So um, here, here, is the, here is the warming that took place from 1915 to about 1945. And sure enough, the glaciers are in a recession. That downward trend of the line means that the glaciers were receding. And then if we look at what's going on in the ocean, the PDO down here stands for Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And that um, is a measure of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific, which of course drives the climate, which drives the, uh, the glaciers. And then in about 1945, uh, we switched from the warm mode here in the PDO to the cool mode over here. Global temperatures declined, the glaciers began to advance. So they are all marching together, uh, all dancing to the same tune. And then if we look at um, the uh, right-hand side, in 1977 it was called the Great Climate Shift. In one year, the uh, sea surface temperatures of the Pacific down here switched from the cool phase here into the warm phase here. Global temperatures started to rise, and the glaciers began to retreat. So they're all dancing to the same tune. And the, the advantage of this is that it shows that we can depend on glaciers to faithfully record what's going on with global climate. They make a really nice um, sort of geo thermometer, uh, if you will. So what this means is that glacier fluctuations are driven by climate changes. The climate changes are driven by ocean sea surface temperature changes, PDO and Atlantic uh, mode changes. And so the real question is, what drives the ocean? What drives the PDO uh, and the AMO? And that's the real question. Well, we know that the oceans are responsible for driving uh, the, um, the, the climates. And so here is what happens during a typical cool period. This one is the 1945 to 1977 cool period which incidentally was the time of the greatest increase in CO2. And it didn't cause global warming because we had 30 years of global cooling when CO2 was at, its, at one of its steepest rises. Uh, during a coal phase, this is what the Pacific Ocean looks like. If I can get the arrow, here we go. Uh, just be glad I'm not doing brain surgery on you. Um, you see the, the blue color? That's cold water. And during a cool phase, a cool mode, the Pacific Ocean has two modes, warm and cool. And for reasons we don't understand, it doesn't have anything in between, apparently. It's like a toggle switch, on, off. It's either warm or it's cold. And so during a typical cool period, like the 1945 to 1977 cool period, uh, the oceans looked like this with cool water going up all around uh, the uh, eastern Pacific uh, coast of North America. The equatorial cold here is the uh, El Nino, uh, which is something a little bit different. But we can correlate then with the uh, cool phase as shown in the middle of the diagram. So when we are looking at a PDO, which looks like the cool phase from 1945, 1977, the lower diagram, that's what the ocean is doing out in the Pacific. That's what sea surface temperatures are doing. So then if we, if we shift into uh, the warm mode, look what happens. The <coughs> thing is so sensitive, I'm sorry. Um, the blue, in the um, diagram on the left is replaced by red, which means warm water. So in one year, in 1977, the Pacific Ocean switched from its cool mode into its warm mode, and bingo, within one year, we get a, a big shift in, in climate, and we start the beginning of what's uh, now known as the global warming period. And so here's what it looked like. Uh, the, this is the PDO index. You see in the middle uh, the cool phase that, that we were in um, from about 1945 to 77. It flipped into its warm mode in 1977. Uh, we were there until 1998. And if you look over here where it says about 2000, in 1999 we flipped back into the cool mode again, which has really important ramifications for what we can expect in the years ahead. The switch in the PDO shown on the lower diagram where you see great climate shift and we switch from from blue to red is also reflected in the temperatures in Alaska. Uh, the top diagram is mean annual temperatures in Nome, Anchorage, uh, and Fairbanks. And in one year, we flipped from cool climate to warm climate, the same year as the flip from cool to warm in the PDO. Clearly, the PDO is driving uh, the climate. I don't think there'd be any doubt uh, about that correlation. 
So um, could this be caused by CO2? If we jump suddenly from a cool period to a warm period, and that's caused by CO2, if global warming, again, 77 to 98, is caused by CO2, we should see a big jump there, shouldn't we? And if you look at the global cooling and look at 1977, where it goes from blue to red, smooth right across it. There's no appreciable change in CO2. So how could CO2 cause that sudden shift in climate from cold uh, to warm? Uh, and the answer, of course, you can't do it. So has this happened before, or is this just a short-term thing? Now, what I did was I looked at the raw data of uh, isotopes from ice cores in Greenland, and in particular at the um, oxygen 18-16 ratio. Oxygen 18 is an isotope of oxygen, and the ratio of those two uh, depends on the temperature of the air at the time that the snow crystallized in the air and fell in the glacier and later became ice. So it basically records changes in the temperature at this particular place, and we can then use that data to reconstruct what the climate was doing here in Greenland uh, for the past tens of thousands, hundred thousand years. And so here's what that data showed. And, and it's, it's very interesting because barely touched the same thing. If I had a long enough finger, I would point at the screen, but I can't quite reach it. Um, I'm just going to, rather than point with the arrow, I'm just going to, you can see for yourself, you start at the left-hand side of the screen, the blue uh, downward uh, trending color you see, it says 1945, in a cool period, shows in the isotope record of the Greenland ice core. It's that sensitive. And then the, warm, the 1915 to 1945 warm period is also reflected in the isotopes, as is the 1880 to 1915 cool period. And as, as you go all the way down to the left, you'll see the Dalton solar minimum was a cold time, the Maunder solar minimum was a cold time, and all of those blue downward trends are times when the climate was cold, and the warm is shown by the red uh, that's, uh, that goes up. If you count the number of times of changes from warm to cool of the same order of magnitude as the global warming that is um, the big issue right now, there are about 25 changes from warm to cold and back in the period of the last 500 years going back to about 1480. We know the ages of these very accurately because each annual layer in the ice in Greenland is marked by a, a dust layer, dirt layer from summer uh, melt. So the accuracy of the dating here is probably plus or minus one or two years at, at the very, uh, very least. So the dating is accurate. The isotopes are uh, telling us the same thing that other records are telling us. And so if we have 25 of these in the last 500 years, what's the big deal about the present one? Where are we now? Well, we are exactly where we ought to be if you extend this pattern all the way up uh, to the um, to the present time, but what's causing it? So let's take a look at some possible uh, causes for all of these changes. We know that global climate changes um, are correlate correlate very well with solar irradiance, with the number of sunspots, the and sunspot cycle length, and also <coughs> in the production of two isotopes, beryllium ten and carbon fourteen, uh, in the upper atmosphere, which are caused by uh, radiation. So uh, knowing that, we can then construct uh, a couple of curves. These are from Willie Soon. Um, and on the curve on the, on the left, you'll see that there is an extremely good correlation between total solar irradiance, that's the amount of energy coming from the sun, and global temperature. If you look at the correlation uh, between temperature and CO2, you see there's virtually no correlation at all. Uh, the length of the solar cycle, the length of the 11-year solar sunspot cycle, correlates also very well with temperature. The blue line is, is temp global temperature, the red line is solar cycle length. So in other words, when the, so when the 11-year solar cycle, which is the average, is longer than usual, we get cold periods, and, um, and, and also the, uh, the inverse. So there's a very good correlation then between uh, temperature and total solar irradiance, so it looks like there must be some <coughs> kind of cause and effect relationship. So let's look at sunspots. These are sunspots. Um, I don't want to take time to, to get into the, the physics of it, 
But the 11 year cycle that we're in right now began about uh, 1996, and if you follow those dates around, it should have ended uh, in about 2006, 2007. We're now in cycle 23, and we're still waiting for 24, cycle 24 to get cranked up. It is way late, and when it's way late, the cycle length is long, and uh, in the past, we can expect to have cold temperatures. The time between solar minimum, on the average, you see in this chart is about 11. We're now out at, at uh, 12 something, 12 and a half, I think, so we're, um, we're overdue. And now, the number of days we've had without sunspots uh, is greater than all others except about 1913, and we're headed for uh, perhaps <coughs> even lower ones. There is a relationship between sunspots and the production of radioactive carbon in the upper atmosphere. The carbon-14 production rate uh, varies with the amount of radiation coming in, and plotting the change in the C14 production rate, which we can get from uh, various uh, kinds of measurements, shows that there is a direct correlation between uh, low sunspot years and uh, C14 production, uh, and we can therefore measure these in various places and uh, see what the solar fingerprint was doing at times of global climate change. It can also be measured in uh, stalactites, stalagmites in caves, this one from Oman, in which the dark curve, the lower curve, it, it essentially read temperature for that. That's the um, uh, 018, 016 temperature proxy. And the top curve, the white one, is the change in the productivity of, of um, radioactive carbon, carbon-14, and see how well they match. So it means there's a direct connection between temperature, global temperature, and the production rate of carbon-14, which means that there's a change in the radiation that's coming into the upper atmosphere that exactly corresponds in this particular data set uh, to what's going on with the Earth's climate. The best example of the relationship between uh, climate and uh, the, what's going on with the sunspots is the Maunder Minimum. The Maunder Minimum was a terrible time in Europe when about a third of the population um, uh, over a period of years, not just here, but uh, especially here, uh, died off from famine, from disease, uh, and, and they were very, very difficult times. Uh, in, 18, in 1609, Galileo perfected the telescope, so we have a record going back to about 1610. And you notice that from about 1650 to 1700, there are almost no sunspots, zero sunspots. That corresponds to a terrible cooling of the climate that, had, that was disastrous for, um, for civilization in Europe. And so we find that there are direct correlations between the medieval warm period and the, the incidence of, of solar changes. The Little Ice Age is the same thing. There's a direct tie uh, between those. And here's one that is really uh, telling. There are five blue areas here on the, on the chart. Each one of those corresponds to a cold period during which time glaciers advanced all over the world. And each one of those also corresponds to a minimum in sunspots. Uh, the 1850 um, to, eight, to 1970, or 1945 to 1977 cooling is nicely shown in the upper right hand, that little uh, blue area. The, Late 1800s, glacial advance from about 1880 to 1915, shows up well as a time of low solar irradiance. The Dalton minimum, which seems to be where we're headed right now. I'll show you some, what's going on at the sun in just a minute. Um, and that shows up as a, as a dip. The modern minimum you know about, and there's, there's also an anima, another one. So where are we headed in the coming century? That's the question. IPC says we are going to warm at a rate of one degree per decade and maybe 10 degrees by the end of the century. That's catastrophic, that's doomsday. We're all gonna die. Um, and so this is their chart, this is off their website, and so we can hold them to that. That's what their models predict. If, if that's not uh, the case, then um, something is wrong. So their prediction is on the upper uh, right-hand side here, one degree uh, temperature increase should be upon us by about 2011. In a couple more years, we can, we can judge whether or not their projection, their 10-year projection was valid. And they're not gonna make it because the lower diagram shows what's happening to temperature right now. Here's the predicted IPCC temperature um, on the upper right, and the actual temperature is shown. We're headed down sharply away from that, so it looks like things are, are turning cold. 
Here is the temperature variation for 2008. The blue areas are places where it's colder than normal. So this is the, the temperature uh, typical of the last couple of years. This is weather. This, is, this doesn't prove anything. <coughs> but what I'm only saying is it fits the pattern. Um, and if you look at what's happening today, you'll see uh, there are blizzards in North Dakota. That's weather. It doesn't mean anything in itself, but it, it fits the pattern nicely. So we're headed on the right-hand side. We're headed down. We're cooling. And what happened to global warming? Um, well, um, global warming is coming at a kind of embarrassing time because we're supposed to be heating up a lot, not just a little bit. And we, just the other day, I was reading that uh, the global warming is accelerating. It's not cooling, it's accelerating. I mean, I don't see how, how we can get there, but that's what they're saying. And what we can be assured of is that the PDO has now turned cold. So in the upper diagram, you see the blue area next to uh, North America. That's the cool phase. And every time we've been in that, we've, we've had cooling temperature. So here's the record. Four out of four times in this past century when we've had cool PDO, we've had cold climate. And we've now flipped into the, the PDO. So on the right-hand side, you see 2008. That's where we, where we are now. And so once the PDO turns cold, it takes at least two decades for it to change back again. So you can, it's a slam dunk that for the next two decades, it's gonna be cold unless the Pacific Ocean does something uh, totally different than it has done uh, all of this past century. So here, here are some possible projections. I made this first one in 1998, which was the warmest year on record uh, in, in the past several decades, and people thought it was crazy. And it turns out it's now happening. Um, the top curve is uh, if we project into the future a cooling, which is similar to the 1945 to 77 cooling, modest. If we look at what happened in 1880 to 1915, the cooling is deeper. If we look at what happened during the Dalton minimum, it's deeper yet. So where are we headed? Well, uh, we were stuck, I'm gonna skip through these uh, very quickly. Um, this is what happened during the Dalton minimum, a little ice age. The uh, cycle four preceded, it looks like cycle 23, which is where we are now, and look what happened. The cycle got very long, and the, um, the, the temperature um, plunged, and so that seems to be uh, where we're headed now. So what does this what does it all mean? It means that the present cooling is a continuation of an ongoing 10-year cooling trend and a 500-year climate pattern. It follows the ocean sea surface temperatures, the PDO, almost exactly, which means that the IPCC model predictions were badly wrong. It shows that global warming is over. We're going to be stuck in this cool phase for at least a couple of, of decades. And at last, of course, it means that CO2 is not the cause of global warming. Um, if you look at the long record, the last 500 years, 96% of the global warming periods in the past 500 years have no correlation with CO2 because they all occurred before the, the rise of, of atmospheric CO2. So we'll skip through a couple of these. Uh, the implications then to, to conclude is that global warming is over. It is the, the past 21 year cycle. So expect 30 years of global cooling, perhaps severe if we're headed for a Dalton. And now we seem to be headed for something like the Dalton, a little ice age, sunspot minimum, or perhaps even, um, even colder than that. Atmospheric CO2 is not the cause of global warming. Uh, global cooling will probably cause an increase in crop failures. It already has this year, big rice failures in Asia, corn in, in the US. There will be increased energy demands and when you couple that with the population increase projected uh, for the next um, 40 years or so, the population will increase, global population, by 50%, going from about 6 billion to 9 people. So there are going to be increasing demands for energy, increasing demands for food at a time when the climate is cooling, and we are going to have also increased energy demands because of the cooling, but lower food production. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we don't want to celebrate the fact that global warming is over because global cooling is worse. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave you uh, with the idea that, that uh, dogma is not uh, good for the free exercise of thought. You can read the rest for yourself. Thank you.